Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. Hello and welcome back. In this video, we'll look at the liver, pancreas, and gallbladder histology in a little more detail. During embryonic development, the liver actually grows out of the foregut at the site of the future duodenum right around here. And the cells of this tiny little liver bud starts to divide exponentially to form this large organ that ends up performing over 200 different functions for our body. Pretty important and impressive organ. In terms of its function within the digestive system, they produce bile, so it's an exocrine gland. And what bile does is it emulsifies lipids. And this emulsification is a process by which a, a big lipid droplet is broken up into tiny little particles. And we can, of course, do this by a lot of mechanical force such as using a blender for example or we can use a chemical agent such as the bile that can break down this large lipid droplet into multiple smaller ones and what this allows then is for the lipase which is an enzyme that can break down the lipids into triglycerides so then there's more surface area for the lipase enzymes to come in and break down the lipid into the absorbable macromolecules so that's the function of bile another function of the liver is to filter the blood that's coming from the GI tract and, and to also monitor it for the level of nutrient, primarily for the level of toxin as well as glucose level. So if the blood coming from the GI tract is high in toxin, the cells of the liver would detoxify. And likewise, the blood coming from the GI tract is too high in glucose level, then the liver can balance it out by absorbing a lot of the glucose into the cells of the liver and store them. And on the other hand, if the blood coming from the GI tract is too low in glucose level, then the liver can convert the, the stored glycogen into glucose and release them into the bloodstream before all that blood from the liver is drained into the inferior vena cava, then into the circulatory system. Speaking of blood, liver is another organ that has dual blood supply. One is coming from the hepatic portal vein, which drains majority of the tissues from the GI tract. So all of these vasculature from the GI tract would drain into the liver by a large vein called the hepatic portal vein. And the majority of the blood coming from the GI tract would be low in oxygen. The other blood supply comes directly off of the systemic circulation from the aortic artery. And off of the aorta, we have the hepatic artery that enters the liver, delivers the blood that is high in oxygen content. Histologically, the liver has a nice, dense, irregular connective tissue capsule, and the parenchyma of the liver is quite cellular. So at higher magnification of the box area, we can see a lot of these parenchymal cells called the hepatocytes, which are these large polygonal cells or spherical cells with large cytoplasm and large euchromatic nuclei that's spherical with punctate nucleoli. So these are pretty active cells. And some of these hepatocytes can be binucleate like these. So it's not uncommon to see that. A number of these hepatocytes will form these cellular cords or plates or rows of cells that are separated away from each other by a thin vascular space in between called the sinusoids. So that's the characteristic of liver histology. It's the highly cellular nature due to the abundance of hepatocytes that are organized into cords and plates. And as we saw just now, the liver is also highly vascular. 
From the gross level, we saw that hepatic artery carrying oxygen-rich blood from the aorta entering the liver. Once it enters, it'll branch into number of smaller and smaller arteries than arterioles until the blood drains into those sinusoids in between the plates of hepatocytes. And likewise, we also saw the hepatic portal vein draining the GI tract and entering the liver. And once it enters the liver, that vein will branch into smaller and smaller veins until they become the venules. Then they too will drain into the sinusoids. At specific regions of the liver histology, we can actually see the two types of vasculature at microscopic level. So higher magnification of the boxed area will reveal an arteriole right here, which would be the end arterial branch of the hepatic artery carrying oxygen high blood, and the portal venule right here, which is consistent in histology with any other venules in the body. And this vessel would carry the blood that is poor in oxygen level and varying concentration of nutrients as well as toxins. And what we see nearby that looks like a lumen that's lined by a simple cuboidal epithelium is a bile duct. Once the blood from the arterioles and the venules drain into the sinusoids, then the sinusoids will run in between the cords or the plates of hepatocytes as we've seen before. So let's look at that area again. We've already seen some plates or cords of hepatocytes like these. And we also saw little sinusoidal spaces or little capillaries that's traveling in between the cords of hepatocytes. And what lines these sinusoids, of course, would be the endothelial cells. Peripheral blood would course through this sinusoidal space. And here it's important to point out another tiny and incredibly thin space that is positioned in between the endothelium of the sinusoids and the hepatocytes. The space is called the perisinusoidal space, or also called the space of this. This thin sliver of space is where the plasma from the blood can exit the sinusoidal space and bathe the hepatocytes and come in contact with the hepatocytes so that the hepatocytes can actually monitor the contents of the plasma and filter it out or balance it accordingly. Within the perisinusoidal space, there are these obscure cells called the stellate cells, also called the etocells, which are thought to provide some supportive roles in hepatocytes' response to injury, as well as storing vitamin A. And within the sinusoids, there are resident macrophages of the liver that can be seen. These cells are called the Kupfer cells that monitor the contents of the sinusoids and phagocytose any potential antigens, dead cell debris, or microbes if they're ever present. And such Cooper cells are easier to identify than the Eto cells or stellate cells in that they're physically positioned within the sinusoids and that their nuclei tend to be a little more elongated. And if we're really lucky, we may even see some cytoplasmic extensions that are similar to other dendrite cells in other organs. So these are some additional cells of the liver. All the blood in the sinusoids will eventually drain into the central vein in the liver. And these central veins are often of varying size, as we can see here. They often occur as solitary, usually spherical openings, regularly placed throughout the liver. These will eventually coalesce and drain into the inferior vena cava. Here is the central vein, once again lined by these endothelial cells. And here we can actually see potentially a sinusoid draining into the central vein. So all sinusoids will eventually lead into one of the central veins positioned throughout the liver. And lastly, we can't forget the fact that the liver is an exocrine gland, which means we should expect to see some ducts. We've already seen an example of a duct when we were looking at the hepatic arteriole and the hepatic portal venule. So looking at that image again, you can see that bile duct 
comprised of simple cuboidal epithelium, at least in this particular position. These bile ducts will eventually coalesce as they emerge out of the liver and to deliver the bile into the duodenum or to let it store in the gallbladder. This unique histological relation between the bile duct, the hepatic arteriole, and the hepatic portal vein, usually kind of traveling together in triad, is often called the hepatic portal triad or portal triad in short. And when this portal triad happens to run together in longitudinal plane, we call that the portal tract. All right, with that in mind, let's talk about uh, three ways to divide the hepatic tissue. The interesting thing about the liver is that depending on how we look at the liver from anatomical perspective or functional perspective, we can focus on different areas of the tissue. And these three divisions of the hepatic tissues is the hepatic lobule, which is looking at liver in this polygonal unit. So almost purely structural way of looking at the liver tissue because it's pretty well organized into the central vein in the middle and the portal triads in the corners of these hexagon and tracts running in between these APCs. Another way of looking at the liver is to look at the portal lobule where we're looking at the liver in a triangular form with with three central veins in the triangular apices and the hepatic portal triad in the center of the triangle. And in this orientation, we're focusing on the direction of the bile flow, which is going from the periphery of the triangle towards the center of the triangle. And then hepatic acinus is when we are actually looking at one central vein at the apex of the triangle with the portal tract making up the base of that triangle triangle. And in this organization, the focus of our attention is in the direction of blood flow and its content because the blood will go from the base of the triangle towards the apex. So let's look at these three divisions of the hepatic tissue in a little more detail. Again, the hepatic lobule at this higher magnification view of the liver, we are looking at the liver from the structural perspective. So structurally speaking, we're looking at this polygonal structure that is flanked by the portal triads and the tracts with the central vein in the center. In the portal lobule perspective, as mentioned earlier, we have three central veins in the APCs of the triangle with one portal triad in the center. And no tissues will ever look like a textbook, so we happen to catch a portal triad or tract running somewhere in the nearby. So for the time being, for the simplicity's sake, let's ignore that one. At any rate, in this organization, we are focusing our attention on the direction of the bile flow. Now, considering that the bile duct is positioned within the portal triad, we're looking at the bile would then have to be produced produced from the peripheral region and drain eventually to the bile duct in the center of the portal lobule. And lastly, in hepatic acinus, we're looking at the direction of the blood flow and its content. So a single acinus is a triangular shaped structure with the central vein at the apex of that triangle and the portal tract that forms the base with the two portal triads forming the remaining corners of the triangle. As you can see, hepatic acinus often shares the base or the portal triad and it's tracked with the neighboring hepatic acinus. So it is not uncommon to see a hepatic acinus described as a diamond-shaped double feature, if you will. The parenchyma of the acinus can actually be divided into three loosely divided zones. Zone 1 is closest to the portal tract, and this is the area where the blood is just starting to enter the sinusoids from the hepatic arteriole and portal venule, which means the blood oxygen level coming into zone 1 would be high, and the nutrient and toxin level would vary. Then we have zone 2 just outside that middle zone, 
And lastly, we have zone 3, which is closest to the central vein and farthest away from the portal tract and the triad, which means by this time, the oxygen level traveling through the sinusoids would be the lowest. Another interesting thing about these three zones is the fact that the hepatocytes in zone 1 are conditioned to function the best at high action level as well as the most well suited for monitoring the nutrient level of the traveling blood and balancing out the glucose level. Whereas in zone 3, the cells are cued to function better at lower action level but also this is where the hepatocytes are more equipped and cued to function in the process of detoxification. Interestingly enough though, with more detoxification, there's more harmful metabolites that can accumulate here, which is cytotoxic. So in cases of acetaminophen overdose, for example, the hepatocytes of zone 3 end up working overtime, collecting more harmful metabolites, and suffering from cytotoxic damage and undergoing necrosis. So in such a case, we might see the necrotic injury occurring in zone 3 throughout the liver parenchyma. The gallbladder is positioned just under the liver and it is actually quite tightly adhesed to the underside of the liver and it functions primarily as the storage site of excess bile. And as for the system of the bile drainage system or the biliary tree, this starts at the ultra structures called the hepatic canaliculi. So these are the things that we can't even readily see with regular microscopy. These hepatic canaliculi are actually nothing more than little openings that are made in between the neighboring hepatocytes, where the neighboring hepatocytes leave a little bit of intercellular space in between their cytoplasm and pinch that little canal off with tight junctions. So that's the hepatic canaliculi. And a bunch of these canaliculi in between numerous neighboring hepatocytes will eventually collect into the properly ductal cell lined bile ducts. And eventually these bile ducts will coalesce with other neighboring bile ducts and become larger and larger until they emerge from the right and left lobes of the liver as the right and left hepatic ducts which then coalesce into a single and very short segment of bile duct called the common hepatic duct. And at this point, from the gallbladder, we have a duct that meets with the common hepatic duct, and this duct that drains the gallbladder is called the cystic duct. And when these two ducts join and drain ultimately into the duodenum, then this portion is called the common bile duct. Now this video is really all about histology, but understanding this organization of drainage system would be a nice context to always keep in mind. Looking at the histology of the gallbladder, here's a cross section and we can see right away that there may be some layered appearance to this gallbladder wall. Kind of similar to the gut tube wall or GI tract wall but not exactly. So the gallbladder wall is comprised of three layers of histological tissues. We have the mucosa, we have the muscular layer, and either serosa or adventitia. Now the mucosa, as we can see, has multiple of these infoldings. Now these are the mucosal infoldings with the lining epithelium and the lamina propria, but these are not like the villi of the GI tract. So these mucosal infoldings can certainly smooth out as the gallbladder fills. The lining epithelium is comprised of the simple columnar epithelium of non-ciliated type. So when we look at the macroscopic view of the boxed area, we can appreciate this beautiful lining epithelium with quite uniformly spaced and lined nuclei towards the basal compartment. The lamina propria is comprised of the loose connective tissue that both forms the core of this mucosal infoldings as well as this layer in between the lining epithelium and the next layer out which is the muscular layer. Now although there are these epithelial lined lumen containing structures
areas within the lamina propria. These are actually not glands. These are, this being a single section through a highly complex infoldings of the mucosa. These are perhaps the basis of some of these mucosal infoldings that seemingly have become incorporated into the lamina propria. So again, no glands in the mucosa of the gallbladder. Outside of the mucosa, we have this loosely arranged multiple layers of smooth muscles. This is collectively called the muscularis propria. We don't have a distinctive inner circular layer or outer longitudinal layer here. Even further outside, we have either the sorosa or the adventitia. Anatomically speaking, the part of the gallbladder that is adhesed to the liver would have adventitia, but the part of the gallbladder that is sticking out into the abdominal cavity would be covered with the serosa. Identifying the adventitia or serosa of the biopsied gallbladder becomes important if there happens to be any kind of tumor that has migrated or invaded into the underlying connective tissue. If this outside layer is comprised of the adventitia, this may indicate that there could be a chance of this tumor having invaded into the liver tissue versus if this area happens to be covered by the serosa, then we could potentially potentially have a, have a possibility of the tumor that have now gone out into the peritoneal cavity. So every single layer of the gallbladder and the gut tube tract wall for that matter becomes quite important. Another thing to note here is that there's no submucosa in the gallbladder nor the muscular mucosa layer. So these are two layers that are lacking in the gallbladder that are present in the GI tract. The pancreas is a secondary retroperitoneal organ that serves both the function of exocrine gland as well as the endocrine gland. As an exocrine gland, the pancreas is classified as the compound ACNR exocrine glands, meaning it has no mucous tubules. Histologically, we're expecting to see a lot of zymogen granules stored in the secretory cells of the exocrine pancreas. These zymogen granules contain a lot of proenzymes that will become activated once they enter the duodenum. The exocrine units also produce a lot of bicarbonate fluids that can neutralize the acidic chyme coming from the stomach. And similar to the salivary glands, the pancreas have elaborate system of ducts, starting from the intercalated ducts or intralobular ducts that drain the acini, which then drain into the interlobular ducts, which then drain into the interlobar ducts before draining into the main pancreatic duct. In terms of the intralobular ducts, there's no striated ducts here in the pancreas, which sets the pancreas apart from the very similar histological cousin that is the parotid salivary gland. As for the endocrine function, the pancreas contain these units of endocrine structures called the pancreatic islets, also known as the islets of Langahan. These islets are comprised of three types of endocrine cells. The alpha cells release glucagon, and this is the hormone once released into the bloodstream, it tells the cells of the body to release glucose, so it ultimately increases the blood glucose level. The beta cells of the pancreatic islet release insulin. This has the opposite effect. It instructs the cells of the body to absorb the glucose from the blood, so ultimately it reduces the blood glucose level. And lastly, we have the delta cells. These are minority population of cells in the pancreatic islet, and they produce a class of somatostatin hormone, which can regulate both the alpha cells and beta cells. The histology of the pancreas is quite similar to that of the salivary glands, that we see the lobular and lobar organization separated by numerous connective tissue septa. But what sets the pancreatic histology apart from the salivary glands would be these pancreatic islets that are pale staining, circular, or spherical units that are scattered about within the parenchyma of the pancreas. So these pale staining units are the endocrine pancreas, 
pancreas and the rest, including the ducts, would be the exocrine pancreatic units. Looking at the exocrine units at a higher magnification in the boxed area, once again, we can appreciate those beautiful acini, secretory acini, forming the spherical units made up of cuboidal cells, usually of dual staining tones, with the basal basophilia, apical acidophilia, indicating the zymogen granules or the proenzymes that are all stored in there. So expect to see lots of serous acini. And at this magnification level, we can also see one unique pancreatic histological characteristic, and that is the centro acinar cells. And these centro acinar cells are typically these pale staining cells that invaginate into the serous acini. And these pale staining centro acinar cells are really nothing more than the very beginning part of the intercalated ducts. So imagine the intercalated duct simple cuboidal epithelial cells kind of invaginating a little too much into the serous acinus which then gets enveloped by the secretory unit. So if we were to make a cross section this way or that way we may see a histological organization such as this. Speaking of the ducts, as mentioned earlier the series of ducts in the pancreas include the intercalated ducts leading into the interlobular ducts which then lead into the interlobar ducts. Intercalated ducts are the only type of intralobular ducts in the pancreas. There are no striated ducts in the pancreas. So in any given histology, you see a striated duct, you can easily rule out pancreas. There's higher magnification of some of these pancreatic parenchyma. And here we can see several things. Number of serous acini with a pale staining central acinar cell that may be potentially leading out into this intercalated duct right here. There's another serous acinus with perhaps a central acinar cell there. Here is a beautiful intercalated duct. Here's another. In fact, we can see the intercalated duct cut in a longitudinal fashion with a narrow lumen in the center. These intercalated ducts will eventually drain into a larger interlobular duct that is also comprised of simple columnar epithelium, but you can imagine how this duct may eventually get larger and become lined by simple columnar epithelium. So even though it's the same interlobular duct, you may have a portion that is lined by the simple cuboidal and portion that is lined by the simple columnar epithelium, both non-ciliated type. So we're seeing that relationship right here. Here's smaller interlobular duct, here's larger interlobular duct, and even larger interlobular duct would be characterized by larger lumen size, larger connective tissue outside of the epithelium, as well as the lining epithelium that eventually transitions to a stratified columnar epithelium type. Looking at the endocrine units of the pancreas, let's pan on these two pale staining structures and look at them at a higher magnification. Here's pancreatic islet. Here's another. These are spherical structures of about 200 microns in diameter. The reason why we are seeing two different sizes most likely have to do with the three-dimensional nature of these spherical units. If we make a cross-section through here, of course we're going to catch a smaller diameter pancreatic islet than if we were to cut it right through here at the greatest diameter. Note that each one of these spherical structures are covered by a really, really thin connective tissue capsule, mostly made up of reticular fibers. And within these spherical units, there are no ducts consistent with endocrine organ. Instead, we'll see a lot of capillary networks fenestrated that traverse through this spherical unit to pick up the insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. The majority of the cells that comprise the pancreatic islets are going to be the beta cells, closely followed by the alpha cells, and only fraction of the cell population would be the delta cells. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course, which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos, go to our website using the link in the description below.